about so like eight to twelve hours, and then eight to the just of the process and the But you know, on a on a Friday morning when I'm not teaching, that is a perfect spot. Where did where are they? I mean, like are there like twenty six And this relationship between the X and the Y, you say, what does the thing mean? You know, and of course, if you go to Wittgenstein's philosophical investigation, he starts off that important book by saying, if we want to understand meaning, we have to understand the extent of definition. So somebody, so he gives the example of a. Um, stonemason or bricklayer who's got an apprentice uh, and he says slab uh, and the apprentice brings him a slab and he plops it down and so forth because and, and what he says there is that the apprentice knows what he means by slab so you say what do you mean by book or what do you mean by bottle which is that example and the authentic definition which is one of the most primitive ways of defining something is simply to say, here is a bottle. You say, okay, you know, I see that. You know, this is a bottle as opposed to this, which is a book. Okay. Now, what does that imply? It implies that we all observe the conventions of language. We know how to behave in a certain way when a certain verbal cue is given. Now, what a schizophrenic will do, and this is why Deleuze was very much interested in, in schizophrenesis of meaning. A schizophrenic will kind of, you know, take out of these verbal relationships between book and bottle and say, oh, they both begin with B. So the two become interchangeable. You can say, I, uh, schizophrenic, I mean, schizophrenic would do this. 
to talk about reading their body. Uh, I have an autistic grandson who's now six years old, uh, and autism is not the same as schizophrenia. But one of the things that is common between autism and schizophrenia is that it, it is much more liberal about association. So when my grandson was like two years old, he would say things like he would he would be talking about a blue boat on the canal. It was an answer, you know, in relationship to uh, a robot, let's say. And so the association of the word robot and boat would remind him of when he saw a blue boat, and so he'd talk about a blue robot. Now that's that's an associative mechanism, which is common in speech. It's also common in, you know, the creative use of language. You know, that's what, you know, assonance, you know, rhyming, uh, metaphor, it's all based on the principle of association. But there are certain social conventions, certain linguistic structures whereby some associations are acceptable and other, you know, associations are. We talk about political correctness, but there's also linguistic correctness. That's why we can learn to talk, you know, and the boundary between nonsense and sense is simply when we draw the line and say, no, that's not acceptable. But what in schizoanalysis, as Deleuze is talking about, this kind of free play of association, these forces which are kind of bringing, you know, possible meanings and associations again in a jumble of kind of intuitive connections that go on the mind and the speaking out of these intuitive connections in ways that isn't, you know, normally considered to be, you know, conventionally uh, appropriate. That that is how, if we want to get to what meaning is, we have to get at what philosophy is really dealing with when it talks about the world. The purest vision of the world as it is, is schizophrenic, not because the schizophrenic is crazy. Again, that's, you know, that's a social convention itself. But the schizophrenic sees things as they really are, in terms of what William James would call the blue and fuzzy confusion. But from the standpoint of schizophrenic, it's not a, a blue and fuzzy confusion at all. So let's go back to the relationship between X and Y, okay? X and Y are two things that come into associative relationship with each other. It's part of a, a process of serialization of meaning. Okay, but now X and Y really have, they, they are not in themselves. What makes them in themselves is only the fact that we have named them. We have said the relationship between X and Y is Z, okay? But what we're really experiencing here is an infinite series of X, you know, A, X sub B, X sub C, on and on to infinity, you know, and X, if I say sub A, X, you know, sub B, on and on to infinity, and why, you know, and so forth. So it's this freezing of the associative connection, because these associations, because they are series, but they converge in that kind of moment of instant, of instantaneity. You know, your uh, Bergson was always very fond of using the example of a snapshot, you know, that. Uh, when, when you take a snapshot, you know, you're not, you, you lose the fluidity of the experience out of which the snapshot takes place. You don't even get the sense of presence of yourself in deciding this is a picture worthy of, of taking in some way. By the way, speaking of my, my grandson, um, you know, he's, uh, you know, he can communicate on a verbal letter way, but he can't write and he can't do math. But he has this amazing ability to see things in his environment. He was given a camera last year, and he, you know, some of his photographs are really incredible. He 
because I mean, you can capture the moment of just snapping the shutter some relationships that we wouldn't even pay any attention to. So, you know, it's a kind of our artistic intuition. So um, that's what Deleuze is really getting at here. So we have to look at these divergent series that connect at some point where we give it a, a, a verbal relationship that belongs to the order of language. And because we, we've somehow designated it in a way that everybody else who shares that same accessible oral language can somehow relate to. But this is as far from, you know, what it is. Because after all, what Deleuze is doing here, he's trying, he's trying to really totally redo Western ontology. He's trying to do Western ontology as I talked about original being, but original being is temporal dynamics associated with that. You know, and the fact that certain things are associable, even though they're not associable with language, means that we can philosophize. All right, so let's let's go back to this. And, and the ultimate series is the relationship between what we call sense and not sense. All right, so he goes on to say to account for this correlation, that is between the word and the thing, and this dissymmetry, we make use of the number of dualities. So remember what what makes them intelligible is not that they are that they are in equilibrium with each other, that they're in disequilibrium. It is once and once excess and lack, empty square and supernumerary objects, a place without an occupant and an occupant without a place. Floating signifier and floating signifier, esoteric word and exoteric thing, white word and black object. This is why it is constantly denoted in two ways. For the snark with the boozer, you see. The snark with the boozer. Now, Lewis Carroll, you know, is talking about snark. You say, well, what's a snark? Well, you know, you don't really have to say what's a snark, you know? Because a snark is always, in some ways, it's always fluid, it's always producing this writhing. Gaggle of association, which by we were able to somehow slap for a moment, just like the, uh, the clicking of the camera, you know, to give it to give it a certain name. But but it's constantly it's constantly changing. The, the series, the heterogeneous series, slides onward. So the snark was a boojum. You see, well, what do you see? You know, it's like. Looking into the rearview mirror, you know, it was there and now it's disappearing and vanishing. And it's that connection between what was there and what is disappearing. It's that it's it's uh, Paul Grillo, uh, the uh, famous philosopher of um, Paul the philosopher of speech, I don't know if you ever seen that. He's always talking about you know uh, acceleration, you know, all those you know strange. One of the points that really really all makes in his earlier writings is that it's actually this little called the ascendance and disappearance. It's only at that vanishing point that we know what a thing was. You know, only when it's gone, as the bird said, you know, you don't really appreciate appreciate somebody until they're dead. You know, you don't really know, you know, what a good thing you had in a relationship with that person for so long. Uh, and because it's the, it's the point of its dissociation or the point of, at the edge of its vanishing that we can somehow find out name it for the first time. The point that Aristotle makes in the essence that we, we, happiness is a concept and it's one of the, the key concepts of, of ethics as the science of how to live a good life. But we don't know what happiness is until we're no longer appointed. So that's that's kind of the idea, you know. 
when when um, Socrates says that his policy is philosophy but meditation on death, perhaps he's not talking so much about what it means to prepare to die, but but using death or the, the limit concept of death as a way of understanding what everything is, because what is is only in terms of what has been, and as Heidegger says, it's being is always somehow projected in terms of possibilities, and once we finally realize the ultimate possibility, the essence of our possibilities, can we truly understand what a thing is. So he says, uh, for the what stars with the Bojan is the appendix of this cat. This is part of the naming that comes along with the ascetic of the Sephira. We should not imagine that the Bojan is this particular fragment of species of snow. The Ronish is a genus of species, that is, a predicate distinction of pure and total. Rather, we are faced with the two dissymmetrical halves of an ultimate instant. Now, remember, this is always this, you know, sliding back and forth, uh, which is always a disequilibrium whereby we can name something. Likewise, the sex of the theory, we learn the Stoics had at their disposal a word for or turf, but they employed it in the doublet in the form of gymnastic. But Volturi was the gymnastic of these words, equals S in a theory, at the same time, thing equals S in another thing. Perhaps we see it's necessary to add to the eon yet a third aspect, action equals S, insofar as theory presently to communicate a form of tangled. Snarks is, this is key, snarks is an unheard of name. It is also an invisible monster. It refers to a formidable action in the hunt, the end of which the hunter anticipates the delivery of the dead. Jabberwock is an unheard of name, an hefty beast, but also the object of a formidable action or of a great murder. Right. So, this is kind of a poetic way of what he really wants to talk about when it comes to the question of, you know, uh, of sense and not um, Sense is denoted, he says, on, on page 67, sense is denoted only by using a name. So it's only when the sense we name it and the name slips from it do we get the sense. If we try to conflate the, name, the sense of a name, we lose the sense of sense and we misunderstand what naming is. Naming, he says, is only a proximate way of dealing with it. Um, in, in the sense, sense is what you might call the virtual of the name. And what is the virtual? The virtual is you know, that which was always there, but we can't name it, and that which will always be there. You know, there are specter in it. That it's always that which will always be there, but we can no longer name it. Because the name was defined to a certain identity, to a certain biography, uh, to a certain moment or a certain enclosure of moment within this process that we call it time. Um, it says one could object out of it, see this is the bottom page 67, one could object out of all of this, all of this we can tell, it was a bad plan of work. I suppose that nonsense expresses its own sense, since by definition it has no But this objection is unfounded. Nonsense really does make sense. The play on words would be to say that nonsense has a sense, the sense being precisely that it doesn't, that it has a name. Okay, that there's one word that sums up this whole book. Let's say one sentence that sums up this whole book. What I've just read. Play, uh, Nonsense has a sense, 
turn to the inside of the So the, this is not our positive at all. We'll be assuming the nonsense says its own sense. We wish to indicate, on the contrary, that sense and nonsense have a specific relationship which can be, which cannot uh, be that of the true and false. This is not a dialectical or propositional relationship. That is, which cannot be conceived simply on the basis of a relationship of exclusion, which is the principle on which the dialectic. This is indeed the most general problem of the logic of sense. What would be the purpose of rising to the domain of truth to the name of sense? And you would only define between sense and nonsense the relation of analogous to that of the true and the false. We have, we have, and by the way, if logic is always about somehow the hunt for the true and the false, a logic of sense is the hunt for the relationship. We have always seen that it's futile to go from condition to condition in order to think of the condition and image of the condition as a simple form of possibility. A condition cannot have with its negative the same kind of relationship as a condition has with its negative. A logic of sense is necessarily determined to posit between sense and nonsense an original type of intrinsic relationship, a mode of co-presence. So, Presence to make sense and nonsense always adhere in the proposition um, as what he calls a co presence. For the time being, we may only get at this mode by dealing with nonsense as the word which says its own thing. Now, this relationship between sense and nonsense is expressed at the propositional level. As in a series of significations as a paradox. And remember, a paradox logically is not a contradiction. What's the relationship? What's the difference between a paradox and a contradiction? So they're very often confused. Can I call on Or, in some ways, the whole question of truth and falsity doesn't seem to apply. Right. Can I ask my other response to this? Yeah, so in, in paradox, I mean, so he gives an etymology of doxa. Doxa. Right. So in, in here, then, paradox is alongside. So they're simultaneously existing. Where, oh, right. where a, a contradiction in You have A, and then you have B, and then you have the um, subalterns of each, so A1 and B1. So if you have man, woman, binary, comma, binary gender, and then you have a man who doesn't act like a man, so he gets associated a contradiction diagonal up to the other side of the binary. So a man who doesn't sexually act like a man in a heteronormative society gets termed with words that label him as effeminate. That's the contradiction, right? Right? Contra is the so against saying words. Would it be fair to say that queer theory Input from concepts of the reading of the mm -hmm. uh, is in some ways looking at gender not as a binary thing you hear about it as the placement of a spectrum. Wouldn't be if it just it just is as a point on the spectrum, it wouldn't be gender anymore. But I can see it more as a kind of paradoxical thing. Yeah, definitely. I think that that's what or, or gender queer. Yeah. The term like So, um, I'll just apologize here a little bit more. Um,
this is in uh, this is indeed the most general problem in the lives of the saints. What would be the purpose of rising to the domain of truth to the name of sin, for only to find between sense and nonsense a relationship analogous to that of true and false? Uh, he says the logic of sense is necessarily to determine the object between sense and nonsense an original type of, of relation. Talking about the paradox of the whole. Uh, uh, paradoxical element is not, the normal laws are not exactly opposed in two figures. These figures, on the contrary, subsume normal words endowed with meaning under these laws which do not apply to them. Any normal name has a sense which must be denoted by another name and which must be, which must be. Which must determine the disjunction filled by the other names. Insofar these names, which are endowed with sense, are subject to these laws, they receive the deter determination of signification. So, in other words, there is this disjunction that is going on in the process of signification. And it is in this area of disjunction, disjunction coming by the heterogeneity of the theory. This symmetry between the two is that where sense is expressed. But sense is expressed not as something which emerges out of either the series of the two theories together, but sense is that which is somehow almost miraculous, you know, comes into being. And this is what he calls the donation. Uh, the donation of sense is really the, the kind of giving of sense, the bestowal of sense. But you could say that the, the only agent that can bestow sense is God. That's why I call it miraculous. Dr. Williams would just so I talk that way, I would change the sense of his sense. Because they're, you know, just like what is a miracle was not like a new rattle. Reality that has no explanatory antecedent, which has no formal nexus within which it's described, or no even conceivable causal nexus. And so forth. And the causal for nexus here is the causal for nexus of meaning and signification, which comes from the unfolding of both the proposition and that which is all dissymmetrical to the proposition, which is the diverse of theory. And it's at it's that moment that somehow we see that, you know, there is always more to the proposition, but we always understand the limitations and the, fail, and the failure of the proposition. You know, so basically saying what it means. And to go back to what I was talking about last time, the relationship between meaning and saying. Saying doesn't always somehow clarify the meaning or produce the new meaning because meaning is always somehow falling apart. And when meaning falls apart, that's when we have this eventuality. We call the donation of sense. So sense and event, in a sense, belong in the same world, so to speak, with each other. Uh, when Deleuze writes, excuse me, when Badu later talks about the logic of the world, there's a kind of Deleuzian subtext to what he's talking about. He, talks, he uses terms, you know, that very much came from Christian theology, miraculous terms like resurrection. He doesn't talk about sense, but in some ways the logic of sense is a kind of resurrection of the very possibility of sense. It is something which comes in in a way that we can't account for or after that we can anticipate, which is what makes an event. The donation of sense is always the key to the event, which both the proposition uh, and the, the effort to explain the proposition uh, you know, converge upon. Yeah, just to answer that when I got to talk about the uh, Refresh me on that. 
kind of like how in the moment you kind of understand uh, what God is doing in your kids and where they think like your mom nags you about something. Yeah. And then later on when you reflect back on that, it's actually just like, yeah, God was doing this to help you relax and get back. Yeah, I think that that could be could be because you know what comes from it. What I'm talking about. So anyway, so we have another week of this, so we can go on with this next week. Anybody have any questions so far? Any observations, insights, illuminations, final provocations, final perverse provocations? I understand the you of open up for me. Reading that. Good. Most people try to read the sentence. You read that either before you read Boyce, right? Or did you read Boyce before? No, I, I read that. No, I didn't write it for several long letters before I read anything. I read. So, do you have that same kind of experience? Or no? Um, I'd have to think about it some more, but there certainly has been some sort of a salvation experience on my part from that area to the Lord. Yeah. In the sense that having read that is what it is. Or a donation of sense of when you were thinking about that either. Right. Yeah. All right. See you next week.